Thank you, Colin. Uh, the, uh, the, the, our next speaker is, um, works closely with Colin at UC Davis and is, um, is a professor of um, cinema and techno technology, sorry, let me get that right, cinema and technoculture studies at a, group, a wonderfully named department in um, our sister uh, institution. She's also the author of The Unmasking of Fascist Aesthetics and has written extensively on the relation of surveillance technologies to forms of social control. So she's extremely well equipped to speak about this. She's also working on a new project involving the artist Rafael Lozano Hemmer and his work on surveillance. So please welcome uh, Chris Rivetto. Thank you. Oh. <clears throat> okay, so obviously I'm a total humanities person, so I apologize about that. I'm not going to be able to finish what I expect to do. But I want to just talk about how I came to, which you've seen just recently from Colin. Thank you, Colin, for introducing Anonymous for me. I've been working on Anonymous for a while, but I've been mostly interested in the concept of anonymity. Um, not necessarily Anonymous as a group itself or its uh, political practices. But what I've been interested in, in particular is the politics of the meme. Um, and the meme as something that does not form consensus that Colin pointed out. Anonymous doesn't seem to have any consensus. Um, but it has dissensus, and so it has a sort of critical value to it. And what particularly interested me in the, the meme of Anonymous um, was this uh, destruction of the identification rule. And I think that is particularly important. We talked earlier about privacy here, which it's not even clear if we have a legal right to privacy. We certainly don't have a right to anonymity, and I think we should reconsider that. What interested me in the meme itself was that it is a hyper-visible image, and yet it's something that points to a non-visible entity. Yet, also in respects, it, it's something that is constantly circulating a form of identity that's modifiable by everybody who touches it. So that's really what interested me in the meme. But Ken had nicely reminded me this morning that I was supposed to talk about something visual, and I have very few visuals for you guys here. This comes from my uh, home institution. Some of you guys might recognize that. But I wanted to sort of talk about, just in two parts, if I manage to get through it. If I don't, just cut me off wherever I am. Um, screening, and the concept of the notion of a screen and what a screen is, because we, it's a double concept, right? We think about a screen as being hyper-visible, which, of course, Officer Pike has become. Um, and at the same time, it also is a veil, and it hides a certain sort of processes uh, behind it. So the screen itself has become ubiquitous and portable, evolving into a personal item that mediates much of our social interactions and integrates our daily routines into global networks. At the same time, the screen that helped to shape our public experiences, the screen we came to understand by interacting with cinema and television, is disappearing. So now uh, the interactive screens um, sort of res that respond to our voices, our touch, our gestures further complicate what is involved in our encounter with and through the screen. The interactive screen demands that we conform to programmed, recognizable gestures as much as it responds to and remembers our personal haptic commands. So, the screen and the sort of behind the screen, the surface of the screen and the behind the screen. The screen promises access and even open access through open windows and visual displays, but the encounter with the screen triggers other mechanisms, algorithms, technologies, and profiling devices that are programmed to map our locations, build archives on our daily behaviors, tracing our contacts, purchases, interests, and movements, and we've talked about that today. Forms of access are not as clearly transparent as they seem, right? And I was pointed out that transparency is a visual term. <coughs> yes, here we get the visuals for Facebook. Even more, participatory forums like poking and friending on Facebook, Instagram, and following on Twitter are connected to more ambiguous forms of data mining and targeting used for marketing purposes exemplified in surveillance and data valence. Right, such as webcam spying, uh, GPS tracking, Google Analytics, zombie cookies, all those things. The gestures of access is 
often either a simple click of a button agree or a click with no button at all, as in the case of cookies. The click of a finger seems relatively straightforward, but it sets off a complex set of invisible handshakes that are consequent upon the initial gesture. The slippage of the screen encounters <coughs> into visible handshakes and contracts, or terms of agreement, as we talked about earlier, indicate, indicates that we have poorly conceptualized and theorized mechanisms in technological environments for managing the fact that identity is a relational process, that as wholly social, wholly social negotiation, its management is never in the hands of one party, but it is about elicitation and recognition. And I want to just sort of point that out because when we talk about privacy, privacy is only given to us as individuals. And if we think about identity as something that's not an individual practice, then we have to really rethink about what we're protecting. Um, so I probably don't have that much time, so I'm going to have to move on to the meme. So what I'd like to sort of talk about with the meme is that it is an encounter on the screen. And here are some nice ones for you. I'll leave this one up for Chris since he seemed to like it. Um, <clears throat> it's an encounter um, that reconfigures identity, privacy, and property. The meme is collective and a collective appropriation that confuses notions of identity with property. It is, you know, what Brian Rotman would call a, a para. It gives you a parasite type of identity, one besides itself. Collective identity on the screen functions more as a meme rather than a form of consensus or community or what Hobbes and Locke would have called the commonwealth, something that has helped to produce a strong state. Here I would like to think about how the meme problematizes what we mean by the commons. And this also sort of came up in one of the last panels. We were thinking about, well, we should have a public discussion. Well, where is that public discussion and where should it take place? So I think that in that respect, we need to really, the meme helps us think about the tragedy of the commons as something greater than maybe we're actually thinking about it now. Aggregation technology and advanced statistical analysis tools have enhanced the capacities of those who wield surveillance technology to know us, often in ways that we do not know ourselves. And in this respect, the meme does not offer us what the avatar or the pseudonym or metadata do. That is, they do not give us an identity, even an imaginary one. The avatar is still a figure that signifies an individual or even a political choice. <clears throat> if we think about the V for Vendetta, the film, or the graphic novel, he picks up the Guy Fawkes mask as a symbol of resistance, but to use this in anonymous operations, it doesn't necessarily mean the same thing. It turns it into something quite generic and modifiable. Um, so unlike the avatar, the meme upsets dichotomies that are fundamental to traditional and political thought and practice, like identification and anonymity, liberation and control, dissent and accountability, privacy and piracy. The use of the moniker anonymous has been common practice throughout history to obscure the legal name of an individual author, but once we, we move from traditional individual uses of the moniker to the new collective ones, exemplified by anonymous or the meme itself, it comes to signify a much expanded kind of anonymity that can potentially include everyone and, e and anyone. This change of scale, <clears throat> I don't have my glasses on, was that two minutes? Okay, cool. <laughs> <clears throat> Changes the very meaning of anonymity and its possible political uses. Okay, so just to compare anonymous to, to Occupy, and I know that some of you guys have seen anonymous masks in Occupy, but unlike Occupy, the Occupy Wall Street movement that makes appeals to ethics and democratic values, Anonymous is neither ethical nor democratic. The rules of the internet, according to Anonymous, holds nothing sacred. Everything is corruptible, dismissible, subject to ridicule, and anything you say will be held against you and turned into something fixed, labeled, and therefore hated. <clears throat> and I would like to argue that this is not a form of radical democracy, but a more radical practice of criticism, albeit one that might favor a male-dominated gamer and hacker culture. 
than a democratic process. <clears throat> there is only the influence of the meme and its potential to go wild. I'll make it with a one minute. <laughs> influence is measured by the repetition of an image, the lolcat, the face of Guy Fawkes, um, the pedo bear that somebody, well, Julia referred to that's uh, meant to brand pedophiles. An idea or a call for action, that's the Sony Ops, the Operation Payback, etc. It is only the memes that go viral that end up enacted on. Men and women can be seen wearing these masks, but those masks do not signify con consensus or anonymous identity. I'll sort of end there and we can talk about some of the other issues uh, in the panel period. All right, thank you.